your spirit now, that same spirit that came as a dove upon Jesus. Let it move in this space, move among us. We might hear your word, hear your message, and know that you are near. We pray in Christ's name, amen. One of my memories of high school is a conversation that I overheard, but really it was a public conversation, I think at a youth group or Sunday school, um, but it wasn't one I was directly involved in. It was between my pastor and a youth who was being especially ornery and loved to push boundaries. I, I know you know you never do this, except for this one youth, I'm sure, um, but uh, I digress. He asked the pastor why the pastor cared for what he did outside of church at Sunday school. Why the pastor persisted in trying to give life lessons or give advice or encourage him to like do good in school and listen to his parents and not get into trouble on his free time. And the pastor looked at him and said, well, you're baptized, aren't you? And the idea the pastor was trying to get went right over the youth's head, my peer's head. But I understood, at least a little bit, my pastor was saying that as a pastor, he had responsibility for those who were baptized to help them live their best life, especially maybe those who were young and baptized. And I don't know that I think that's exactly right, I mean, I'm not here to give you all life lessons for the most part. But I think there's something in that statement that is true. I think baptism places a claim on us. Not just on us who are ordained, although there are special claims there probably too, but on all of us. Baptism places a claim on us. And that claim isn't that you get to be lectured by your pastor how to live lives and make good choices. I mean, if you want me to tell you, I'll help you, but nevertheless, it's a different claim on us. One that is there, and one that when we choose to claim it, to embrace it, can affect how we live and how we interact with others. And I want to explore that claim this morning in this message. It begins with the words that Jesus hears at the end of the Gospel text. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my Son, the Beloved, whom I'm well pleased. This is an important moment for Jesus. It's definitional, it's identity-giving. You can debate, and scholars do debate, round and round and round and round, how much of whom he was Jesus knew before the his baptism. The synoptics don't always make it clear. And John, of course, does his own thing always. But it's very clear in all three synoptic gospels that the moment of baptism and the spirit that comes connected to it, whether in that moment, or at the end of the moment, or in the case of Mark, soon after that moment, the moment of baptism is a defining moment for Jesus. It marks in all three synoptic Gospels the beginning of his ministry, the moment that he begins to live out his earthly work for God. Directly from this, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted and directly from that, he comes and preaches the good news. He finds disciples and begins his work on earth. It is this moment, this identity marker, that, that moves Jesus from being a carpenter's son doing who knows what for the first 30 years of his life to being God's son who preaches and teaches, who moves towards the cross and the empty tomb. This moment is the beginning of all the earthly ministry of Jesus. It's a definitional moment, a moment where he claims for the first time, really, his identity as the Christ. I think it's also meant to be a moment where we hear our identity. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we're Jesus. We're not meant to be Jesus. And yet, the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul and others make clear that we're meant to see in Jesus' baptism 
our own baptisms, to see in his life how we're to live our life, for to root ourselves in Jesus and try to imitate him as best as we can. And I think that means his identity is one that we partially share. Now, Jesus is the only Son of God. We're adoptees into that. We're adoptees into it in unique ways. And I think that way is the claim here at baptism. And the reason I think that is Isaiah 42. If you look at Isaiah 42, it's very clear that the Gospel writers knew this text as they comprised their story, as they took what they had been told and heard about Jesus and shaped it into a narrative. They saw echoes in Jesus of this text, of the servanthood found in 42. And I think because of that, we can look here for clues of what this claim Jesus takes on at baptism means for him and perhaps for us. The text says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not faint, grow faint, or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you in righteousness by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the dumb prisoners from dungeons and the prison of those who sit in darkness. That's the claim of servanthood of God is able to. And I think it's one we can hear in Jesus and hear in ourselves. Now, let me be clear. I don't think Isaiah was imagining or even envisioning Jesus. He was writing for a different purpose, a different time. But who the servant is is left unclear. In other servant songs, the servant is clearly Israel. In one song, a servant is Cyrus, king of Persia. But here, the identity is left unclear, which means it's okay to look at this and project it in other places. As I already said, the gospel writers did that in Jesus. They heard this text and said, oh, Jesus echoes this, and wrote in ways that reference it and connect to it. And Jesus' life. Jesus' life reflects some of this, right? Jesus looks at a different Isaiah text in Luke as his claim to fame, but he lives out this very much. That's a weird phrasing. He lives out this in his life. He gives sight to the blind, releases those that are shackled by evil spirits, shackled by the ways of society that keep them outsiders, keep them outside. He brings them in and says, no, you're welcome here. He touches those who are untouchable, he heals those who need healing. He proclaims a new way of life. He proclaims a release to those who have been captive. Jesus lives out this servant text in his life. It's not who Isaiah envisioned, but it is how Jesus lives. I think it's our call as well. Again, not in the same way. We are not Jesus. Praise to be to God for that. But we too are called to see those who feel entrapped and find ways to help them find freedom. We too are called to see those who need healing, who need grace, who need people who are called by God to be servants to all the peoples and proclaim a message, a life of salvation. We too are called to work for justice in all the many ways and forms it takes, to strive for a more just world, a world that reflects the kingdom, a world 
that reflects the will and ways of God. We too are called to these things because God loves us and because of our baptisms. Because when we allow ourselves to fully live into that baptism, to remember the water on our own foreheads, or if we were immersed, the water that covered us up, remember Jesus' baptism and his call, and his life, and the ways we are called to live it out. We won't be perfect. We'll mess up. Because Jesus is Jesus and we are not. But our role, our task, our calling is to strive after this take our baptisms and hear in them the claim of servanthood, the claim of caring for others, the claim of being a people who strive always to live for God. You're baptized, aren't you? My pastor said. And my fellow youth totally missed it. I'm not sure I fully understood it. I was only a senior in high school, after all. I had many years of education and many, many years of learning how to not be quite so stuck on myself. But there's the call. You're baptized, aren't you? And therefore you're called to love. Therefore you're called to care for others. Therefore you're called to be a servant of God, a servant for all the people striving for justice and righteousness and shalom, striving to be a people who reflect the kingdom because we're baptized, aren't we? Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing our hymn.